Chapter 4 After assembly, the girls marched to the music room for their chanting lesson with Miss Bat, the chanting mistress. She was tiny, thin and very old, with frizzy grey hair, which she wore in a plait twisted around the back of her head. Because of her habit of pressing her jaw into her chest, she had three chins and this looked very odd on top of her thin figure. She wore circular steel glasses attached to a chain round her neck. Not the dainty gold kind, but more like a bicycle chain. And she always had a conductor's baton tucked behind her ear. She sat at the piano in a black dress with grey flowers and played a rousing march as the girls entered. Chanting's ever so dull, whispered Mildred to Enid as they marched into the music room. Don't you believe it? Enid whispered back with a surprisingly wicked glint in her eye. They all took their places and Mildred managed to position herself with Maud on one side and Enid on the other, though Maud still looked very crotchety and wouldn't return Mildred's smile. Miss Bat struck up the opening chord to a chant they all knew very well and the girls began. To Mildred's surprise, Enid was singing completely out of tune. Not loud enough for Miss Bat to hear, but loud enough so that Mildred couldn't concentrate on the right notes herself. Verse after verse droned on, with Enid just missing the correct notes and the pupils around her struggling to keep in tune. Mildred sneaked to look at Enid, who was smiling sweetly and obviously doing it on purpose, then glanced at Maud, who was desperately trying to keep a straight face. A sudden mad burst of uncontrollable laughter welled up in Mildred. She clenched her teeth and racked her brains to think of something sad, but the sound of Enid's voice droning flatly on beside her was too much, and a loud snorting noise erupted from Mildred's nose like a motorbike starting up. Mildred put her hands across her mouth and even tried stuffing her handkerchief into it, but it was no use. A real fit of the giggles was upon her, and she just doubled up with helpless laughter and giggled till her face ached. Mildred Hubble! The inevitable words rang out across the room in a tone which implied that Miss Bat would stand no more nonsense. Everyone had stopped chanting and Mildred's peals of laughter echoed embarrassingly round the silent walls. Come out here at once, ordered Miss Bat. Mildred clumped through the rows of pupils and stood next to the piano. She took a deep breath and managed to look serious, though her face was flaming and the sound of Enid's voice still resounded in her head. When Miss Bat was angry, there were two things she always did. First, her head would begin nodding, which it was doing now. And secondly, she would take the bat on from behind her ear and begin conducting an invisible orchestra, which she was also doing now. Mildred could tell that she was furious. What, may I ask, is so hilarious that you are prepared to disrupt the entire chanting lesson for the sake of it? inquired Miss Bat coldly. No one else seems to be laughing. Perhaps you would let us in on the joke. Mildred stole a glance at Maud and Enid. Maud was staring intently at her feet, and Enid was gazing at the ceiling, the picture of innocence. It was, began Mildred, but a splutter of laughter came out, and she dissolved into a giggling wreck again. At last, the wave subsided, and she was left breathless but able to speak. Now, Mildred, quavered Miss Bat in a voice like a taut violin string, I'm waiting for a reasonable explanation. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, Enid was singing out of tune, said Mildred. Well, said Miss Bat, I hardly think that's a reason for such a display of appalling manners. Come here, Enid, my dear. Enid came and stood next to Mildred by the piano. Now, my dear, said Miss Bat kindly, you must not feel shy because you can't sing very well. I hope you are not too upset just because Mildred decided to make a spectacle of herself on your account. Now, let me hear you sing one or two bars of Eye of Toad, and we shall see what we can do to help you along a little. 
Enid obliged in the same wavery, off-key voice as before. I have toad, ear of bat, leg of frog, tail of cat, drop them in, stir it up, pour it in a silver cup. This was the last straw for Mildred, who abandoned all efforts at keeping control and gave herself up to complete hysteria. As you may imagine, it was also the last straw for Miss Bat, and Mildred found herself on her way to the headmistress's office for the first time that term. Chapter 5 Miss Cackle was not pleased when Mildred entered her study. Good morning, Mildred, she said wearily, motioning the hapless pupil to sit down. I suppose it is too much to hope that you are sent here with a message or for some innocent reason. Yes, Miss Cackle, murmured Mildred. Miss Bat sent me to you because I was laughing in the chanting lesson. One of my friends was singing out of tune and I, I couldn't stop laughing. Miss Cackle looked at Mildred over the top of her spectacles, and Mildred wondered why Enid's singing didn't sound the least bit funny now in front of her headmistress. I wonder, said Miss Cackle, if there is any hope at all for you in this academy. You take one pace forwards, then four paces backward. It's the same old story, Mildred, isn't it? And the term's only just begun. I see that Miss Hardbrim was right when she disagreed with my plan to put you in charge of the new girl. I have put you in a position of responsibility, Mildred, and you must live up to it, not let me down. Yes, Miss Cackle, agreed Mildred fervently. It would be a sad thing indeed, continued Miss Cackle, if you were to lead this innocent new pupil up the garden path with you, would it not? Now, child, for the last time, pull yourself together and let me hear no more about you for the rest of the term. Mildred assured Miss Cackle of her good intentions and meekly left the room. As there was still a good hour of chanting left, and Miss Bat had told her not to come back, Mildred decided to sneak up to Enid's room and take a look at the monkey. Mildred could hear her fellow pupils chanting in the music room as she crept up the spiral staircase to Enid's room. It gave her a delicious sense of freedom to have a whole hour stretched out before her while everyone else in the school was imprisoned in a stuffy classroom. For once, the sun had filtered through the shroud of mist and shafts of sunlight fell dramatically through the slit windows onto the cool stone steps. Well, I certainly made a mistake about Enid, thought Mildred. She's worse than I am. She giggled again at the thought of the tuneless chanting and opened the door of Enid's room. As she did so, the monkey, which had been sitting on the bedpost, made a dive for the door straight over Mildred's head and off down the corridor, screeching with delight. Mildred saw its long tail whip around the corner as it plunged down the spiral staircase. Oh no, thought Mildred, setting off after the creature as fast as she could. She arrived breathless at the bottom of the staircase, only to find that the monkey was nowhere to be seen. Oh dear, she muttered aloud, what am I going to do? What should you be doing, Mildred? asked a chilling voice behind her. Oh, uh, nothing, Miss Hardbroom, replied Mildred, for it was her form mistress who had appeared from nowhere. Nothing? echoed Miss Hardbrim frostily, at this time of day. Why, I ask myself, should Mildred Hubble be hurtling around the corridors when everyone else is usefully employed in a lesson somewhere? And why, I ask myself, should Mildred Hubble's socks be trailing around her ankles? Mildred bent down and hastily pulled them up. 
Um, I was sent out of chanting, Miss Hardbrum, she explained. Miss Bat told me not to come back, so I've got nothing to do for the next hour. Nothing to do? exploded Miss Hardbrum, her eyes flashing so wildly that Mildred backed away. Well, I would suggest that you take yourself to the library and brush up on your spells and potions for a start. And then, perhaps, if there is any time left, which I doubt, you can come and find me in my room, and I will give you a test on what you have learned. Yes, Miss Hardbrum said Mildred, desperately trying to work out where the monkey could have got to. Mildred took the corridor which led towards the library. She looked back over her shoulder and saw that Miss Hardbrum had vanished, which was very confusing, as you were never sure if she was watching invisible or if she had walked away. Mildred walked on for a few more corridors and then waited and listened. All she could hear was the faint chanting of Form 1 in the distance, so she set off in search of the monkey again. Something moving caught her eye through one of the windows. It was the monkey, halfway up one of the towers, swinging about by its tail. It had managed to get hold of a hat from somewhere, and it was wearing it rammed down over its ears. If Mildred hadn't been quite so horrified, she would have seen how funny the animal looked. Oh, come down, monkey, please, she called as softly as possible. I've got a nice banana for you. But the monkey only let out a shriek and climbed a bit higher. Mildred ran as fast as she could and fetched her broomstick. As far as she could see, the only way to get the monkey down was to fly across and catch it. Nervously, she stepped onto the window ledge and lowered herself onto the broomstick. She gave the command for it to fly, but unfortunately, as she gave it a tap, which is the signal for it to start. She slipped, and the broom zoomed off with Mildred hanging on by her arms. Stop! yelled Mildred, at which the broom stopped and hovered in mid-air. Mildred tried to haul herself onto it, but it was impossible with nothing to push her feet against. Her arms were practically out of their sockets, but she was so near the monkey that she decided to try and command the stick to fly on. As luck would have it, the monkey was fascinated by the sight of the broom and jumped onto it, where it proceeded to run up and down and swing by its tail. Down, Mildred commanded the broom, and the extraordinary little group whooshed downwards. As they came into land, Mildred was shocked to see that the yard was full of people. Form 3 had been having a broomstick lesson with Mrs Drill, the gym mistress, and had witnessed the whole episode on the tower. Even worse, Miss Hardbrum was standing next to Miss Drill, with her arms folded and both her eyebrows raised. Mildred felt quite ridiculous as she floated to the ground in such an ungainly position with the monkey swinging beside her. Well, asked Miss Hardbrum as Mildred took the monkey from the broom and stood holding it tightly in case it should escape. I, uh, I found it, exclaimed Mildred. On the tower, sneered Miss Hardbrum, wearing a hat. Yes, said Mildred, almost dying of embarrassment. It was up there, so I uh, thought I ought to bring it down. And where did it come from? demanded Miss Hardbrum, narrowing her eyes. You haven't been arguing with Ethel again, have you? She was thinking of the time last term when Mildred had changed Ethel into a pig during an argument. No, Miss Hardbrum, said Mildred. Well then, Mildred, where did you get the monkey from? This was a very tricky situation. Mildred could not possibly sneak on Enid, but Miss Hardbrum's terrifying stare made Mildred feel that she probably knew anyway. Perhaps it was just as well that a member of Form 3 stepped forward. She got it from the new girl's room, announced the girl. I saw her coming out of there earlier on. Enid's room, queried Miss Hardbrum, but Enid has a regulation black cat. There is no other animal in her room. She sent the girl to fetch Enid from the chanting lesson, and Enid soon arrived looking bewildered. She did not flinch when she saw Mildred with the monkey. Is this your monkey, Enid? asked Miss Hardbroom. I only have a cat, Miss Hardbroom, replied Enid. Mildred's eyes widened in disbelief. Are you 
quite sure it isn't Ethel, asked Miss Hardbrum severely. Yes, Miss Hardbrum, said Mildred. Miss Hardbrum, however, did not believe her, and she muttered the spell which would change the animal back to its original form. To Mildred's surprise, the monkey vanished, and in its place stood a little black cat. <gasps> That's my cat, cried Enid, as the cat jumped into her arms. Mildred, said Miss Hardbrum, you have been told about this before. First Ethel, now Enid's cat. For goodness sake, when is this nonsense going to end? Mildred was astonished. But Miss, I... She gasped. Silence! said Miss Hardbrum. Two days you have been back at school and already twice in disgrace. At least this encounter has allowed Enid to see what a bad example you are. I hope you will take care not to follow in Mildred's footsteps, Enid. Now, run along, both of you, and take care, Mildred. Just think before you embark upon such an escapade again. The minute the two girls were round the corner, Mildred asked Enid what on earth was going on. Simple, said Enid. It really is my cat. I changed it into a monkey before break time this morning for fun. I was going to change it back before tomorrow when we had to go for sports day practice. I didn't know you were going to go in and let it out, did I? Chapter 6 Sports day loomed ahead like a black cloud for Mildred as did anything where competition was called for. She hated the idea of trying to beat other people, mainly because she never won, and it was all so humiliating, but also because it just wasn't her way of doing things. As well as this, Maud was being very trying. Just because Mildred had been put in charge of Enid, which meant she had to take Enid around with her, Maud had gone off in a jealous huff and had even gone as far as teaming up with Ethel. Mildred could hardly believe it when she saw the two of them together. She knew Maud was just doing it because of Enid, so she pretended not to take any notice. But in fact, it nearly killed her to see her best friend arm in arm with her old enemy. There were various events on the sports day agenda. Pole vaulting, sack racing, cat balancing, relay broomstick racing and prize for the best trained cat. Everyone practised very hard in the weeks leading up to sports day. Mildred had long sessions with her little tabby cat, trying to teach it to sit up straight instead of hanging on with its eyes shut, but little progress was made. Mildred and Enid ran races against each other and always tied, but this was no indication of merit, as they were equally bad. The week soon slid by, and sports day dawned grey and misty. For once, Mildred was wide awake when the rising bell sounded, as she had been tossing and turning for most of the night with dreadful nightmares. One was about finding a monster on the back of her broom in the middle of the relay race, and it turned into Miss Cackle, who said, Mildred, you've done it again! As the first peals of the bell rang out, Mildred dragged herself out of bed and rummaged around for her sports kit. She found it crumpled up at the bottom of her sock drawer and tried to smooth it out so it would look a little bit more presentable. Some mornings were worse than others, she reflected, as she pulled on the dingy grey Airtex shirt and black divided skirt which hung limply to her knees. The grey socks and black plimsolls completed the picture of gloom as she plaited her hair tightly. There was a knock at the door, and for a happy moment she thought it must be Maud. But Enid put her head around the door, and Mildred remembered Maud had gone off with Ethel. Don't laugh said Enid as she brought the rest of herself into the room. Mildred obliged with a snort of mirth at the sight of Enid's sports kit. I said don't laugh, said Enid smiling. I know they're funny but I haven't got a proper pair. She was wearing a vast pair of black knickers that were pulled up under her arms. <laughs> haven't you got a smaller pair? asked Mildred. No, replied Enid. My mother buys everything with growing room because I'm so big. You should see my vests. Some of them trail on the floor when they aren't tucked in. <laughs> I shan't be able to keep a straight face with you in those, said Mildred. Still, it might put the others off. How's your cat? 
I'm not bringing it, said Enid. It's been a bit off colour since the monkey incident. I don't think it could cope with broomstick riding. I'm bringing Tabby, said Mildred, taking the cat from its position curled up on the pillow. I've been training it every day, but I don't know if it's done any good. Chapter 7 Enid and Mildred sat in the cloakroom to be called for the first event, which was the pole vault. To their great consternation, they discovered that they had been entered for everything, mainly because they were both so tall, and this gave rise to the completely false idea that they must be good at sports. "'We're bound to come last,' said Enid despairingly. "'We don't have to.' said Mildred, stroking the tabby cat's head, which was sticking out of the top of her shoe bag. We're taller than everyone else. We ought to be better at them. Exactly, said Enid miserably. But we aren't. What we need is a touch of magic. Oh, Enid, said Mildred anxiously. I can't even do that properly. You weren't here when I made the wrong potion in the potion lab and Maud and I disappeared. It was dreadful. Leave it to me, said Enid with disarming confidence. Mildred watched as her friend took the two poles from the window and waved her arms around them, muttering the words under her breath. What are you doing? asked Mildred. Shh, said Enid. You'll mess up the spell. A minute later, Enid handed Mildred's pole back to her. Come on, she said. We'll beat the lot of them now. Mildred felt distinctly uneasy as they joined the contestants for the pole vault. She looked up at the bar, which seemed to be at least a mile high. I'll never get over that, she whispered to Enid. Mildred Hubble, announced Miss Drill. Oh no, gasped Mildred. I'm first. Just jump, said Enid with a wink. You'll be all right. So Mildred jumped. She charged along the run-up strip, banged the pole onto the ground, and as she did so, an extraordinary thing happened. The ground suddenly seemed to be made of a strong, springy material, and both Mildred and the pole went soaring up into the air. From somewhere far below, she heard Enid shout, Let go of the pole! Glancing down, Mildred saw to her horror that everything was way below her including the pole vault bar and the school walls. She was so shocked that she hung on even more tightly and saw that a turret was looming up in front of her with gathering speed. Like a guided missile, Mildred and the pole shot straight through one of the windows. Fortunately, the castle-like school did not have glass in any of them, and crash-landed in the middle of a table, all set out ready for somebody's tea. Lying dazed on the floor amid shattered teacups and pools of milk, Mildred saw to her dismay that she had hurled herself into Miss Hardbrum's private study. The pole was neatly broken in two, with half embedded in a portrait of Miss Hardbrum, and the other half in the cat basket, having just missed Miss Hardbrum's cat, now snarling and spitting on top of the cupboard. It wasn't very long before the door opened and Miss Hardbrum, Miss Cackle and Miss Drill all came bursting in through the door. The terrified cat leapt up onto its owner's shoulders with a yowl. Nice of you to drop in, Mildred, sneered Miss Hardbrum. However, it was hardly necessary to use such an unorthodox method. Everyone else seems to find the stairs perfectly adequate. I'm sure I do not have to remind you, Mildred said Miss Drill, that it is against the rules to use magic in any sporting event. I just cannot understand it, sighed Miss Cackle, removing the squash jam tart from Mildred's hair and absent-mindedly feeding it to Miss Hardbrum's cat. I can hardly believe that one of my girls would cheat, and that poor new girl witnessing such an example. Shocking! Shocking! Mildred silently ground her teeth when she thought of the number of times the poor new girl had got her into trouble since term began. 
This must be positively the last time that anything of this sort happens, said Miss Cackle sternly. You are disqualified from the rest of the events, and if I see you in trouble even once more this term, then I shall have to disqualify you from the school itself. Mildred gasped. <gasps> yes, Mildred, Miss Cackle continued. I shall be forced to expel you if this reckless behaviour continues. Now, go to your room for the rest of the day and ponder upon all I have told you. Mildred was only too glad to escape to her room. She curled up on her bed with her little cat and listened to the rest of the school laughing and cheering outside as sports day continued. It's impossible, Tabby, she said. I shall never get right through to the end of term without anything happening. There was a tap at the door, and in came Enid. What happened? she asked. Where did you land? Oh, it was awful, said Mildred. I ended up in Miss Hardbrun's study. Miss Cackle says she'll expel me if I do anything else this term. What about you? Did you go too high as well? Oh, no, said Enid. I realised that I must have over-magicked the pole, so I pretended to faint and got sent off to the restroom. I'll have to nip back in a minute. Did you get hurt? Not really, said Mildred ruefully. Just twisted my ankle a bit. I'm all right. Well, cheer up, said Enid brightly, opening the door. At least nothing else can go wrong today. I'll see you later. Mildred managed a weak smile as Enid disappeared into the corridor. Oh, Tabby, she said miserably to the little cat. We've got one more chance. That's all. <laughs>